Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be with you again. Uh, thank you, Laura, for reading and for leading us in prayer. Hopefully, you've got your Bible still open, uh, open in 1 Peter. Um, what I want to try and do this morning is to tie up what has gone on in the past couple of weeks um, and link to what is coming as Peter writes his letter. But in a, a crucial phase, if you like, in his letter, it's, it's a central point and it links to what's gone before and ties in to what's ahead. Um, Peter writes further about how to live as believers um, in chapter 4. And so we're living as God's people. We've looked at all these things. And today we're thinking a little bit about the church. But Peter writes more about that in chapter 4. So we will deal with that more directly then and in more detail in a week or two's time. But for now, I want us to do a number of things. To look back at why Peter wrote a look again at the example of Christ and what his death and resurrection um, achieved for us, for a lost world, for a broken world. And whilst we're doing that, I want to keep in mind the challenge of how we are to live in our everyday world, in everyday life, in all areas of life. For the first century believers, obviously there was some nuances that are different for them than for us today but the principle remains how we live and how we are challenged to live through the scriptures in this world today um, I don't know uh, about you um, I, I quite like nature programs I can be often found flicking through the channels and seeing if there's um, a good nature program to watch I have to confess, um, I'm not keen on a lot of the commentaries uh, of the nature programs and some of the things they spout and come out with. But I do find it fascinating, uh, some of the great designs um, in, in creation and some of the intricate details that we see there. And you'll have seen these programs, no doubt, just like I have. Some of those programs where creatures, um, all kinds of creatures, uh, land, sea, sky, whatever it is, um, are able to camouflage themselves and almost they become invisible in their environment. Um, it's sometimes for safety reasons uh, to protect themselves from other predators. Um, other times it's for predatory reasons they are able to blend in so much that people or other creatures cannot see them and then they're therefore able to attack and eat whatever it is they are attacking of course you've got the chameleons haven't you and the incredible change of colors that can go on within their their skin within their um, systems to enable them to adapt and to change to any given environment. And we could go on and on about the nature programs. You, you know what I'm speaking about here. At this point, I was thinking of telling a joke. I'm rubbish at jokes. But about the army and uh, the guy who went into an army and navy store um, and said to the assistant, uh, I'm looking for a camouflage jacket, but I can't find it. Um, can you help me? terrible joke I know isn't it but the principle remains about camouflage about blending in to the society in which we are in and Peter as he writes to these first century Christians remember what the world was like at the threat of Rome the threat of persecution the empire of Rome in a few years time Nero would 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 raise Jerusalem to the ground and Christians would be scattered across the empire in fear of their lives it was a world that was full of persecution, a world that was full of ridicule, a world where Christians would have been marginalized, um, imprisonment and death was a threat that they faced every single day. And Peter, as he writes, he says this to the believers, do not blend in to your world. Do not camouflage yourself and be like your world. Do not blend in to your culture. You as a believer are to stand out and be distinctive. Not for your sake, but for Christ's sake. 
real challenge to them. And I guess no less of a real challenge to every Christian in every age. And he writes this letter to encourage them, but also to instruct them in this. And as he does that, he reminds them that they are obviously not alone in all of this. And he points again to the example of Christ. He points to other Old Testament examples. Remember, the Old Testament would have been in the main, their Bible. And so he points to people and situations from the past. People who've gone before. And Peter writes this letter to encourage the believers to say, listen, you are not alone in all of this. Keep on. Keep going. Follow the example of Christ. And as you keep on and keep going, remember this, right the way back in chapter 1, verse 2, you have the company, the presence, the Holy Spirit living in you, and His work is an ongoing work of changing you to be more like Christ, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. He's your assistant, your helper, your strength. And as we come to chapter 3, and as chapter 3 unfolds, Peter brings about a a strange story in one sense, but reminds us further of a couple of examples. Again, he points to Jesus, but he also points to Noah. And he points them to the work also that God is doing in his children in the here and now. And so Peter wants to remind them, and as we read, remind us of who we are and whose we are. So who are we? We are Christ's. And whose are we? We are Christ's. We belong to God. We are children of God. And His calling on His people is sure, and He will keep you even when suffering is part of your day. So then, as God's people in this world, be distinctive. Don't blend into the culture and the ways of the world. Now let's just go back and read and remind ourselves of this outline from chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Here's what Peter says. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, remember they are passing through this world, aliens, strangers in this world. Why? Because heaven is the home of the believer and that is where we pilgrim to on our journey. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, unbelievers, that's just a term for unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Now last week, uh, Ian Lancaster Lanks helped us to understand verse 18 of chapter 3. But I want you to see again how Peter aligns Christ's experience with the believers. This is what it says in verse 18 at the start, for Christ also suffered. So in the suffering, Peter says, you are not alone. You don't go through this as alone of this alone. Jesus is a fellow sufferer. Of course, his level of suffering was completely different from ours. He took upon himself the full weight of suffering. He understood the full weight of temptation. He understood the fullness of persecution. He understood the fullness of ridicule. And yet never gave in one single dot. 
And yet because He has also suffered, He is with us in our suffering, says Peter, to those first readers, but also to us. And Christ Jesus, in His life and in His death, proclaimed the gospel. He was mocked. He was rejected. He suffered but eventually was vindicated by the power of God as God raised him from the dead. And then we go to the next example, just further down in chapter 3 after verse 18. The example of Noah. Peter says Noah too is an example. Now it's a peculiar little set of verses. But here's the logic of this passage. This is what Paul Tripp says in a sermon. He's a, an American pastor, an American writer. says, this passage, this is the logic. Noah, another example like Christ, by building his ark, understood and believed in the reality of a coming judgment. He heard the word of God accepted the Word of God, put his trust in the Word of God, and by faith built an ark, knowing that one day God's judgment would come upon the earth. And for 120 years, he built the ark. Each day, each nail that is hammered in, each bit of tar that is placed over the wood, each wood that is planed and put together, each and every one of those days, he preaches the gospel as he puts his faith and trust in God. And he stands out. And he's distinctive from his culture and from his world. As he preached, he was mocked and ridiculed and scorned. But just as Christ was vindicated by the power of God in being raised from the dead, so Noah too was vindicated by the power of God as he and some of his family were saved in the ark when judgment came alongside numerous animals. That's the logic of this passage. You will be saved, says Peter to those readers, by this same God as you suffer as you are mocked, as you are scorned, you are preaching the gospel. You are living as God's people in society, in the workplace, in the home, in the church even. Take encouragement because it's the same God who has saved Jesus and vindicated him, who saved Noah and vindicated him, will and has saved you and will bring you into resurrection life. But we know from last week as well when Lang spoke that Christ was more than just an example. He's our substitute. Remember? Him for me. He died in my place. He was my substitute. The righteous one for the unrighteous one with the sole purpose of bringing us to God. We're not going to repeat all that went on last week, but we will come back to this theme as we just close our time shortly. So in the light of all this, let's just backtrack a little bit again and ask ourselves the question, as God's people, how are we to live in this world? Here it is. Uh, another look at our flip chart, another look at the outline, another look of the strategy, if you want, that Peter mentions in verse chapter 2, 11 and 12. Avoid sin. Do good. Leave the outcomes with God as people come to faith in God because of what God has done in us and through us. As we preach the gospel in avoiding sin, in spite of persecution, in spite of suffering. As we preach the gospel in doing the good that we know ought to be done in Christ, 
in spite of the suffering. Then we preach the gospel and there will be outcomes, good outcomes. There will be blessings, says Peter. And all of this, our example is be like Christ. All of us believers, whatever our circumstances, wherever we find ourselves, whatever our standing is in life, we are called to live a life that is not about camouflage and blending into society and actually not even standing out. No, we are called to be distinctive and to live differently. The reading that Laura had with us um, just a few moments ago from chapter 3 and verse 8 begins to list some godly virtues that because Christ is in us, because we are believers, they flow out of us in part, in measure. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be united, united in Christ, united in the gospel, in harmony with each other, be sympathetic, Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. More things that we will read about in a week or two over in chapter 4. And we know, of course, that Christ is the perfect exponent of all of these things, of all of these virtues. But we know, too, that the challenge for the believer is the challenge to be like Christ. Obedience is a theme that Peter has running through his five sections, his five chapters in this letter. Be obedient to Christ. What marks out a believer is a desire to be Christ-like. It'd be hard, wouldn't it, if we, if we didn't want to be like our Heavenly Father. It'd be strange, really, if we had no desire to be, be like Christ or become more like Christ. Now, don't get me wrong with this. Were these first century believers perfect in this? Absolutely not. Am I perfect in this? Are you perfect in this? Absolutely not. Of course we're not. We're, we're 10,000 miles off the target that we ought to be. We had a reminder, didn't we, that we're in a war setting. Chapter 2, verse 11. That's the setting for the believer. It's as if we're in a battle. As if we're in war. So my nature... And my natural response is not to want to love. Not to want to be compassionate. Not to want to be kind. I, I have to work at those things with Christ's help, of course. It's most natural for me not to love. It's easier not to be compassionate. It's easier to spout out from my mouth what comes out of the heart, deceitful speech, an evil tongue. I have to keep a check on my tongue because my heart and my mind think things sometimes that are not wholesome and not good. And we hear the phrase, don't we, about biting our tongue. And that's the work of the Spirit in us. Wanting us to live like Christ. Wanting us to be more like Christ. Wanting us not to be like our world and our society and to blend in, but to live distinctive lives in all of these ways. So that's the call, the challenge to the believer. Don't blend in. Don't give in to what is wrong. 
do the good you know in Christ is right. And trust God both with the present and the future because He is with us in the present and He's preparing a future for us as we journey. We've already seen in in previous verses in chapters 1 and 2 of how Peter has used Old Testament examples. And in this section, as we, we just scan for a moment or two, verse 10 onwards, Peter quotes directly from Psalm 34. And Psalm 34, Peter takes it that this psalm actually is speaking of Christ. That's ultimately who this psalm is making reference to. And we have this pattern of avoiding sin, doing good. Here's the outcomes found in these verses. Avoid evil. Turn from sin. Verses 9 and 10 and 11. Do good. Verses 8, verse 9 and 11. The outcomes, the blessings found. Verse 9, verse 12. Peter's repeating what's gone on before. So whatever the believer is, whatever situation the believer finds themselves in, show Christ by embracing a life that Christ demonstrated for us. We turn to repent, turn from our sin, avoid sin. I just need a drink. Just let me grab a drink. So whatever the believer is, whatever the situation, show Christ. Embracing the life that Christ has demonstrated for us. Repent. Turn around. Turn to God. Run to God. Avoid sin. Embrace the goodness of God. Let Him live through you. Trust God, says Peter, for present and future blessings. They will come. And as we've already said on a number of occasions, we know that we cannot do that on our own. We can't. We are weak. We are sinners. Sinners saved by grace. So who is our helper in this? Who is our helper through this? Who is with us in this? Of course, Christ is. He lives in us by His Spirit. His Spirit is at work in us. And the work of the Spirit is to make us more and more like Christ. Yes, to bring us to to, um, an awareness of our sin and bring us to repentance. But the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit is to make us like Christ. Christ. Now it's hard for us to imagine, isn't it, going back to the first century. But can you imagine for those first century readers the encouragement that these things, as Peter writes in his letter, would have been for them? As he reminds them that in their suffering, And in their persecution, they are not alone because Christ has gone before them. And see what he's done and what he's achieved on the cross. Who was he? Back to verse 18. He was the perfect substitute. He was the Lamb of God who lived the perfect life. Who lived that perfect life that we couldn't live facing the full force and range of temptation without sin and without blemish. And he goes to the cross on our behalf, making full payment and declares, it is finished. That is the hope of those first century believers. Christ has gone before them. (laughs) 
And it's the hope for us as 21st century listeners today. Christ has gone before us. We are born in sin. We are unable to rescue ourselves. We are unable to make ourselves acceptable to God. And Jesus has done it all. He's paid it all on our behalf. And Jesus brings us to God. He adopts us into his family. He calls us his children. What an encouragement. What a hope. In this world, in a world that may reject you, in a world that will hurt you, there may be suffering for us and hardships for us, there will be times of pain. And yet Peter brings along to us a great reminder that Christ is our example and how to live in the midst of all of that. But more than an example, he's our substitute who has purchased our eternal acceptance with God. As a believer in Christ, you are eternally accepted in the eyes of God because of all that Jesus has done for you. So Peter says this, go, go and live as God's people in your temporary home in this world. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have within you, the hope of Christ. As you speak, as you live, do this with gentleness and respect. What a challenge for us to live as God's people in this world. In the home. Hey, even in the church. How we live together in the church. Do we reflect Christ in society under the authority of those God has placed? What a challenge for us. Well, we've just got a couple of songs that we're going to listen to or sing along to, if you wish, as we finish. A song that's called... God in this city. Put together with a few photographs of Liverpool and the surrounding areas. A challenge for us. The, the Christian message needs to be taken into our city. God is a God of this city and he longs to save. And he uses you and I to reach out with the gospel in our city. A song which reminds us that Jesus has done it all. He's paid the price. His work is done. It is finished. And he's patient just as he was patient in Noah's day, he is patient in our day, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. He's paid it all. He's done it all. But one day, judgment will come. So go and live for Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Be distinctive for God's glory. Amen.